I left off the last episode putting out a call for beta testers. In this episode, I'm gonna update you on how that beta went, the resulting changes, uh, an issue I had with Google Auth verification, and then how I'm preparing for launch. So like I said, I put out the call for beta testers and I got about 20, which is kind of what I was hoping for. And it was a handful of iOS dev YouTubers, uh, as well as a bunch of you who are iOS developers. And both of those are good, right? YouTubers for obvious reasons, but when other developers are beta testing your app, that's really good too, because you know, they're developers. They've done some QA on their own apps. They know what edge cases to look for and all kinds of crazy like data entry stuff. So I got a lot of good feedback from them. And I wanna give a quick shout out to Jason Mitchell, who was insanely helpful and very thorough with his beta test. He found so many edge cases that I would have never thought of. I think he might secretly be a QA tester full time, not an iOS developer, cause he was damn uh, good at it. Now I'll spare you every little detail, but it's the typical stuff, right? Bugs, crashes, little UI issues, ways to improve the user experience. Uh, certain screens were confusing for first time users, which makes sense because we don't have any empty states in the app at this point uh, or any like onboarding. So it's kind of just like, hey, figure it out, which was kind of on purpose just to see how people could figure it out because that was very uh, enlightening. And then of course you get like the typical like feature requests. So all that stuff comes in through this first phase of the beta. So we spent the next few weeks just squashing all these bugs, making all these improvements in the app. You can really tell it's getting a lot more solid because you know, this round of beta testing, this was the first time anybody outside of myself, my co-founder have like seen the app. Right? And when you're building the app, you're, you're kind of too close to it sometimes, right? The whole, you can't see the trees through the forest, or can't see the forest through the trees. That's what it is. Uh, that thing, right? You get too close to it. So it's nice to have outside set of eyes looking at it. So again, we learned a lot in this beta. And one major overhaul that resulted from this that I want to point out, again, because I'm not going to go into detail on every little thing, but I think this was interesting, especially for you developers out there. So I talked to Kilo Loco, uh, another iOS dev YouTuber that you may be familiar with, and he had mentioned that he wanted rolling 12 months on our charts. Right now, this app in the beginning is based just how I run my business. And I think of things in years, right? So 2021, here's all my data. 2022, that's like how I think of things. Well, Kilo brought up a good point, you know, especially when you look at our charts in the beginning of the year, right? I'm talking to him in the beginning of 2021, it was January at the time, and you just have one bar. I think this screenshot is gonna show two bars because it's February now, but you get the point, right? In the beginning of the year, there's not a lot of data to show and these aren't really great charts. So having the option to toggle between current year and rolling 12 months uh, was a nice recommendation by Kilo. So we decided to do that. However, upon implementing this, we discovered the way our model was set up wasn't really great for this. And back to what I said about how I think of everything in years, that's how our data model was set up in the beginning, right? And again, this is my mistake for not thinking ahead on having more flexibility in the data. But anyway, we had this object of an income stream and there's more properties, but this is just the basics that you need to know for this explanation. So an income stream had a year and an array of values. There's 12 values, you know, it's hard coded 12 zeros. And then once you put data in a month, you know, the, the actual dollar value would go for your income for that month. And that was the initial data structure, which works fine when everything is compartmentalized to a year. However, when you want to be flexible with your data, and again, a big part of creator view is being able to slice and dice and compare your data any way you want. So in this case, we want to do rolling 12 months, but what if we want to do the last six months, 18 months, 36 months, right? We want that flexibility to be able to just plug a start, and, uh, start date and an end date and it pulls it up, right? Rather than having to pull out each year and, and mess with it. So again, mistake on my part, um, structuring my data from the beginning, but again, this is what a beta is for and getting feedback figure all this stuff out before launch. So what we did to fix that, instead of having a in, uh, concept of an income stream, which was uh, had a property of a year, we broke that down to a smaller building block of an income month. So the income month has you know, a stream name, uh, a date, which we pulled a month from, uh, month and year, obviously, and then the value. So right, we just kind of broke down one building block into smaller building blocks. So now we can make these core data or cloud kit fetch requests, get all these income months, and then piece them together on the client however we need. But when they're broken up into the smaller building blocks, it just gives you a lot more flexibility. So this was an absolute no brainer to do, but it was a pretty big overhaul in our code because the concept of income touches so many screens, right? Goals, a dashboard, your income view, all the charts. So it was, it was quite the overhaul, but again, an investment that had to be made because again, the data visualizations are gonna be so important to this app. We only have three of them right now, but there's gonna be many, many, many more, and this was crucial to allow us the flexibility to have a blast with data visualizations. 
Now let's talk about this Google Auth verification process. So in Creator View, in order to get your YouTube analytics data in for this channel stat screen, uh, you have to authenticate your YouTube channel with Google. Well, if you put this in your app, uh, Google has to verify your app. And it's a whole big process. Well, while you're in development uh, and you're not verified, you see this scary screen when someone tries to authenticate, right? It says, this is not a verified app, it's danger, go back, right? Obviously you don't want this in your production app. Once you get verified, this goes away. The verification process takes a while though. In fact, Google even says, allow a few weeks for this process because you know, you'll be going back and forth on email. And uh, they're not wrong. <laughs> I went back and forth probably, I don't know, seven to 10 times on email trying to get this like verified. So I guess the lesson here, if you are gonna put something like this in your app, budget some time for this. But the, the roadblock I hit was throughout this back and forth, pretty late in the process, I discovered that in order for your app to be verified, you have to be on the app store and like launched at least from my conversations. Maybe that's wrong, but <laughs> with who I was talking to, that's what they said. And that seems, mm, I don't know, that doesn't seem right to me, but hey, I, I just rolled with it. Uh, but also another thing I forgot to mention was when you're unverified, you have a limit of 100 users. So I have to launch Creator View, like, hypothetically, right? I have to launch Creator View, not get 100 users, which <laughs> not gonna be an issue, and have this scary warning until I get verified. So. That's kind of the plan here, and this is also why uh, there's been such a long time between the last episode and this episode, because I was going through all this and I didn't want anybody to know we had kind of launched. So anyway, the plan around this was to do a, a stealth launch, like I just kind of said. I, I launched it to the App Store, I didn't tweet about it, I didn't make one of these videos like announcing it, telling everybody, uh, kind of wanted nobody to know, wanted zero downloads. Because again, you see that scary screen and you're limited to 100 users, and those 100 users, beta testers count. So I'd already had like 20 to 30 <laughs> users of that 100. Now they've been pretty quick to respond, so I only expect it to be like a couple days uh, on the App Store without verification. So it should be no harm, no foul, not, not the end of the world, but it does kind of suck that it's out there in the public and you're, you're dealing with this. So hopefully it's only a couple days. Now let's talk about some of the miscellaneous business stuff I was doing during this phase of the beta. Because this phase of the beta went about two weeks, going back and forth with users. We're, we're putting out fixes, putting out new builds, et cetera. But I'm also doing like, you know, getting the Creator View bank account set up, uh, doing all the Apple documentation you have to do when you have a paid app on the store, all the tax forms. And I also took the time to get a website up and the official privacy policy in terms of service because the, the privacy policy and stuff is required for the Google auth verification. So you can see the website here. Quick note on the website, uh, it is just an MVP, just like this whole product. Meaning, uh, you can see it's pretty basic. It's, it's structured off my personal site, which you can probably tell just on the basic structure. Because again, I just wanted to get something up there quick that told people what the app did and just I needed some sort of a website. Now eventually I want to hire a you know a professional front end dev to make this like legit. Uh, that'll probably be, I don't know, six to 12 months because I want to wait for you know the Mac app to be out, the product to mature a little bit. So we'll live with this site. And of course I'm gonna make you know improvements to it over time and iterate on it. So it'll get better. Um, but it definitely, you know, I'm not a professional front end developer. So that is in the plans, just probably not for another six months to a year to make it look professional, but we're living with this for now. So after a couple weeks of that first phase of the beta, we went away, we squashed all the bugs, made all the improvements, made the fixes. Again, the app is looking pretty solid and we're getting closer and closer to launch. So this last phase of the beta is what I called the RC beta or release candidate beta, right? This is like, hey, we think we're ready to launch. Uh, let's just one more sanity check, have people bang on it, try to break it uh, before we launch. This lasted about a week and it actually went relatively smooth. Again, Jason Mitchell was the MVP here. Very, very thorough, caught a lot of final like little edge cases, but all in all, nothing dramatic, right? It was a lot of, lot of polish and again, just making the app solid. So it went a lot smoother than I expected, which is always a good thing. So after we fixed all the issues in the release candidate beta, things were looking good, it was looking solid. Uh, I implemented subscriptions, right? The in-app purchase, you can see our subscription uh, offer screen here. Tested those for a couple days and we're ready to launch. Well, stealth launch. Again, gotta wait for that Google Auth issue to iron itself out. We'll talk about that in the next episode, uh, which is the launch episode. So see you then.